Hi, it's Des here. I'm in Pittsburgh in America and we are at Share 2019 and I have the pleasure of being joined by Stuart McIrvine. Now Stuart is the Director of Product Management for Intelligent Operations and Security at Broadcom's mainframe division. Stuart, great to see you. Thanks for joining me on camera. Oh, it's always a pleasure to be with you, Des. Thank you. Indeed, and thank you very much for being on my podcast recently. I, we got some fantastic feedback and so much so that people are asking when you're going to come back on the show. So we'll oh, definitely, wonderful. definitely have you back on. Thank you. So we're here in Pittsburgh, we're at SHARE 2019. Uh, it's a unique event because it's um, a vendor-supported event but it's all about the community and the users, which I think is, is interesting. When we normally go to these big events, there's a lot of sales pitching, I guess, and that is, it's, you know, buy my product, et cetera. This is more about birds of a feather from what I've seen so far, and this is my first year, so uh, I'm still getting up to speed, which I think is unique, but um, congratulations on a great event and, and the amazing work you do supporting, the, I guess, the ecosystem around it, and the community and, and the event itself. Thank you. Yeah. Now, um, I want to talk about a couple things with you. Uh, you're keynoting today, and I'd like to delve into what specifically you're covering. And then I'd like to circle back into one of the bigger uh, topics around the data that's inside organizations and how they're being challenged to just even understand what they've got and process it and get some insights from that and enact mm -hmm. on it. But firstly, um, you're keynoting today. Tell us what you're talking about and what are some of the key points uh, you'll be covering. Right. So. Uh one of the things you mentioned is this is very much a user conference and uh, we're not here to sell products, mm -hmm. right? Well, so one of the biggest things is sharing best practices, helping people understand what is the best way to do something. Right. And in this particular uh, speech that I'm doing is covering security, right? And it's looking at, there's a massive amount of information, right, that companies have on their systems, everything else. What they lack is the insights into that information to leverage that information, right. to use it for different purposes. In my case, for this particular talk, it's about security. So it's really about the leveraging the information these companies have and using best practices to better secure themselves, as you say, to prevent breaches or whatever else it is. Indeed, well I guess this is a challenge that people are faced with now in a number of phases that they've got uh, customer-driven disruption for demand for better levels of services, that uh, I guess the celebrity experience that we talk about. Mm -hmm. they then got the challenge of that uh, digital transformation that everyone's trying to get through to use better technologies. And this deluge, this tsunami of data coming up from different places with its business systems, applications, whatever. And most of it relates to a security environment, some form as to who should have access to it, why they should be able to use it, when, how, what sort of treatment. Um, <clears throat> and I guess, as you said, getting insights from that data as to what security issues they've got in the first place. Because um, I, I think at the end of the day, one of the biggest challenges you're facing is helping your clients not end up on the front of New York Times as right. a data breach incident, right? Yep. Tell us about that sort of uh, journey that company, <clears throat> when companies come to you, sorry, and they say, well, we, we don't know what we've got, um, help us discover that, and then how do we, I guess, uh, uh, you know, enact some of that data-driven decision-making process around the security challenges we're facing? Yeah, so that is exactly right. That, that if You couldn't have been more accurate with your point, we don't know what we've got, mm -hmm. right? So the first piece is trying to understand what they have, right? Even just understanding their data landscape, right? right. You know, where are all the minefields, right? Where's my sensitive data stored, right? So getting that level of understanding, and then based on that, you know, who's able to touch that in my organization? Right. And I guarantee every company we talk to, at least 50% of the people that do have access shouldn't have access, right? Wow, that's an amazing statistic. Oh, it's huge. 50%? Yeah. 50%, and when you think about Gosh. it, when we talk about um, you know, people having access to information they shouldn't have, and then you couple that with the fact that the biggest area of vulnerability are insiders with access mm -hmm. to information, right? You put these two of those together, right? That's your first um, point of attack, right? right? You've really got to address that. So it's understanding the landscape, who can touch that, and refining those access controls significantly right. reduces right. risk. And is it the case, uh, I mean, certainly from my experience, but I'd love to get your insights, is it the case that most of the incidents of that type where people have access to data they probably shouldn't have and could potentially provide some treatment to that data they shouldn't have, it's not for nefarious purposes, right? It's often the case that someone just has taken their eye off the ball or the game and, and, and things have changed or they've deployed something or upgraded something and they've just forgotten to tick that box. <clears throat> and I guess that's where the Broadcom solution really uh, is like a safety net that you don't have to know all the moving parts because your platform and your tools will do that for them. Right, yeah, exactly. So um, you're right, it's not always for nefarious purposes. Yeah. A, lot, a lot of times people just make mistakes. Right. right? You have users that uh, you know, often for very good reasons have very high privileges, right? They can do pretty much anything on mm -hmm. the system, mm -hmm. right? Well, if they make a, mis make a mistake, they make bigger mistakes than most right. people, yeah. right? So you've got to be able to use you know, analytics and machine learning to be able to track what these people are doing, to let them know, 
this is outside of your normal behavior. Yeah, right? yeah. And things like that, and start to catch that. Because yeah, we're all human, we make mistakes. Indeed. And, and their privilege users make some massive mistakes sometimes. Well, it's like that famous uh, phrase that goes along the lines to uh, err is to be human, right? Yep. Um, when we think about that whole intelligent operations and security piece, <clears throat> we're really talking about deploying tools that automate that process, that remove the humans from both the discovery and the reporting. I, I guess this is probably a transition for most organizations where they've been fairly human-centric, people have been checking you know, firewall policies and, and rules and, and logs. What you're talking about now seems a lot more intelligence applied to that in an automated process where the humans are removed for good reason mm -hmm. and scale. Because I think that's the other challenge we face is there's so much data and so much complexity that humans can't keep up with the speed and the pace and the scale. Is that fair to say? Absolutely fair to say. So a couple of key areas you touched on there is there's so much information, you know, um, <coughs> as powerful as our minds are, right? Mm. We cannot disseminate, we can't analyze that level of information. We need the help of the machines, right, basically. W one of the first parts is to get rid of the noise, right? identify the information that's important. So that's one part of it. The other piece that you mentioned, which is critical, is the automation. Now that I've found out, let's say, the root cause of the problem, let me try to fix it. Mm -hmm. Now, an area I have to bring in that's critical here is as these machines are learning, right. okay, they still need the expertise of us humans. Indeed. Right. Yep. So when they're learning and they're about to kick off, let's say, an automation, mm -hmm. right, to drive a resolution to you know the root cause that they found, um, they still ask. They look for some sentiment analysis. You know, um, so they look right. for a human to right. say thumbs up or thumbs down on this, and they learn. Right. Yeah. So what we're doing is we're bringing in the knowledge from the subject matter experts right mm -hmm. into the system, so that over time that automation becomes more and more the right automation. Right. Right. So right. two areas, being able to analyze this enormous amount of data and then leveraging the subject matter experts right, to drive the right automation moving forward. Yeah, I think there's a lot of concern uh, for people when they think you know, the robot's going to take my jobs, quote unquote, um, but you, you've really nailed it well there and that is that the software is going to simply make us smarter and able to scale better and we're still using right. humans to curate and gate that decision process in the final you know, go ahead and make this change process. Right. And I think that's something really critical that, that um, viewers need to really clearly understand that there is very rarely a point where the tools are going to make a mistake that a human hasn't been able to catch or curate at the front end. Uh, Correct. It's the scale at which they do it. And I guess also over time, you train these models using machine learning and, and art, some form of artificial intelligence to learn from each decision they make. It knows that this is the right type of decision to be presenting as an option versus some random thing. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely right. And the, the more it does, the smarter it gets. Now, your your keynote, um, if people are going to leave with one key thing from your keynote today, what would you love them to take away? I mean, I know there's a lot of information you're going to be sharing, but often, uh, humans being humans, we, we only remember a couple of things. What would be the key thing you'd love them to come away from your keynote with to really get a sense for, oh, that, that applies to me? Right, so this is a security audience. Um, <coughs> and security audiences typically tend to think about, you know, how do I bolt the doors and keep right. things secure, right? <laughs> I want them to, to kind of flip that mindset around to understand they have an enormous amount of information, data mm -hmm. on these systems, right? Whether it's logs about what the users are doing on the system, where their data is, everything yep. else. I want people to understand we've got to better leverage that information, right? And this is right. what I'm going to go through right. in, in, the, in the presentation, to understand how to better leverage that information, to make ourselves more secure, but also be more proactive and understand when things are trending the wrong way and we're about to have a breach mm -hmm. rather than, oh, we just had a breach, now yeah. what do we do, right? So it's, it's basically leverage the information that you already have uh, to be better at security, quite simply. Brilliant, yeah, yeah, well, when we were off camera earlier, you were talking about one of these key challenges, and that is that organizations have this deluge or tsunami of data that's been created for all the digital systems we've got, and they often find it difficult to get insights from that data or find some way to make a decision based mm -hmm. on that type of data, and I guess there is no more important space other than security right. uh, and the underpinning operational component, uh, and, and any automation that's happening with that, to be not only aware of what data you've got, and as you said before, who's got access and the type of treatment, um, what are some of the, the things that people are coming to you now with um, where they do have that scenario, they thought they were in control, and they've had this little uh, eureka moment where they realize we, we don't even know what's in our data. We don't know how to make decisions on what's in that data. Um, what's that journey like for them when they come to Broadcom and say, Stuart, help us through this process. We, we just realized we've got truckloads of data. We really actually don't know what's in there. 
what are the mm -hmm. key steps they need to go through and how does Broadcom sort of take them through that journey from zero to hero to get them back into a safe place? Yeah, quite simply the step. So let's let's pick a scenario like preventing breaches, which is a very right. topical one today. It Indeed happens, it happens is. very, very frequently. And um, the, the first piece is understanding. Understand what you have, you, you know. So what does my, I, I call it da <coughs> data landscape. What does right. my data right. landscape look like? You know, where, where is the sensitive information and what classifications do I have, right? Yep. And based on that, because some of it's more sensitive than others, different risk levels, mm -hmm. and then I apply different investment from a security technology perspective yep. um, to the different risk categories, right? So understand the data landscape, modify my access controls, especially from the privileged users based on that landscape. Mm -hmm. Again, it's all about information, you know? Yep. Gathering you know, the information on what I have, refining my controls, right? It's a fairly simple process, and then it's critical to monitor what okay. happens after that, monitor what right. the users, because don't say, well, yeah. monitor my access, I've finished my access controls, I'm yeah. done, yeah. right? It's a constant life cycle. Well, there's a, there's a great line where people say that you can't manage something you can't measure, right? And I guess this applies more than ever to this type of data. Final question, if I can. I mean, there are, you know, these are core challenges within the walls of an organization, some sort of enterprise, um, particularly with the likes of the federal government. Uh, there's federal and state levels of controls with you know, compliance and governance and regulatory requirements. We've now got some very big things like GDPR, for example, mm -hmm. that people also have to comply with. You, m you must be seeing a, a, a yet another wave of challenge for people where it's not just the data we have and how we're treating it and who's got access to it, but also what's happening around us. Who else has got access to it? Who else shouldn't have access? How's it being treated? And are we even asking those, let's say, users for, or customers for the right to use that data and treat it some way? Is, what, what does that look like in a conversation when people come to you and say, well, we thought we were under control internally, now the rest of the world shifted on us. It's like, because it's like a, a game of shifting sand, isn't it? That no matter where you step, the, the ground's going to move always under you. But GDPR must be a really big challenge for organizations. I mean, you've had the EU, US uh, Data Shield, and then the Swiss had their own version, and mm -hmm. Australians have got their version of the Privacy Act. But GDPR seems to be just a whole nother level of challenge. What are organizations doing with that? How are they responding, and, and what's Broadcom doing on this space for them? GDPR is a big challenge, mm. um, and I, I even go back more uh, further in history. Um, so you look, I mean, when the mainframe was around in the beginning, right, there were very few regulations, privacy regulations, right. so we were, we were just collecting data, mm. you know, yeah. not putting any controls around it. And then the privacy regulations started to come in, suddenly we're, uh, suddenly we're faced with this problem. I don't know where the data is that I'm now supposed to wrap controls around. So right. that's a huge problem. Yeah, yeah. GDPR added, added a whole different level of complexity to that because you know you and I have the right to be forgotten. Mm, right? mm. So now an organization's got to find out every instance of Des's uh, yeah. private information and get rid of it if you want to be forgotten. That's hard. Oh, right? it's, it's nigh on impossible for some organizations. Right. Right, so, so that ability and then to get through an audit, because in audits you have to be able to prove that you have yep. done everything yep. in compliance with the regulation, right? So proving it's hard. So what companies are coming to us asking about is, again, help us understand our data landscape, help us find where this information is, right? And one of the most important pieces is, how do I get through an audit, right? Mm. Give me the yep. necessary reporting that basically demonstrates to an auditor, I've got my act together with respect to GDPR, PCI, whatever. Yep. Right. I imagine there's a case that, you know, when we think about the financial institutions and, and even just you know, personal accounting, I, I do sort of monthly, quarterly, and annual uh, statements or reports just so I know I'm okay and that I'm compliant. So when I get to the point where it's the end of the financial year, I can pay my tax, I don't have a nightmare. When it gets to corporations and large enterprise, I mean, is it the case with the likes of GDPR, and particularly the security and, and IT operations space, that they're now aiming to have your tools provide regular reporting so that they're doing self-checks so that when an audit comes about, they already know they're okay, they're not sort of, <laughs> they're proactive rather than reactive, because I think there's a lot of reactive behavior in, in organizations of various forms. This, to me, seems like we've had this tipping point where companies are now saying, Broadcom, we want to be proactive. We want monthly reports to the board where we can assure our chairperson that we are compliant and we will pass an audit no matter what. Correct. Right. Yeah. yeah. Quite. Quite. In a nutshell. Absolutely right. Proactive is the key word here, right? Okay. Because if you're not proactive, oh, yeah. honestly, it's expensive. And everyone, we're yep. we're businesses, right? Yep. That, that's we're here to make money. We're here to make profit. When you add more expense, you know, that diminishes our profits, right? Indeed. So, so that is critical, and that's why I, I highlight the point of continue to gather the information to understand where you are, mm -hmm. and keeping it a life cycle, right? Because if you don't, if you think you've you've stopped, right? You'll yeah. be out of date within a month. Yeah. 
uh, you know, you're, you're back to ground unable, zero. Absolutely, right. So it's continued to do that and being able to kind of run your reports, um, not just prove to yourselves before you prove to the auditors, mm -hmm. but you know, being proactive is absolutely critical. Fantastic. Well, Stuart, it's been great to see you, and I'm really excited Thank to see yourself. your keynote later today. And congratulations on a great event. I think you know, very few people fully recognize the investment, the time, and the resource, and the effort that goes into an event like this, not just for the actual annual share event here at Pittsburgh, but also sustaining that, that whole ecosystem and the community around that. Um, and I guess at, at the end of the day, that whole name, share, is essentially the, the verb that describes what the event's about, which is mm -hmm. sharing information, birds of feather, uh, building networks, getting to know people in your, your industry that you may even be competitive with, but can share knowledge for the benefit of the whole mainframe community. Certainly. And see, well, thank you so much for the time. It's been great to see you and uh, look forward to having you on the podcast and, oh, the, and on camera again soon. Oh, it's been a pleasure, Dave, as always. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Stuart. Appreciate it. Yep.